We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. Furthermore, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and public health experts do not recommend that people in the United States take precautionary measures beyond staying informed. George Monbiot says he now supports nuclear power. To explain why, he joins us now from Oxford. But the extraordinary fact is that no one has yet received what is believed by scientists to be a lethal dose of radiation. There, there's a growing body of evidence that uh, radiation in excess of what the government uh, says is, are the minimum amount, amounts right. you should be exposed to are actually good for you and reduce cases of cancer. これは明確な動物実験ではなくて環境の汚染のノーマイクロシーベルトが100マイクロシーベルトパーアーを起こさなければ全く健康に影響を及びません昨日いわき市で答えられました今いわき市で外で遊んでいいですかあ、どんどん
to the to the fetus. And we know this this is not a, a new, something new. We but when you're in hot particles, unless there are many, 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 it's very difficult to detect a single hot particle. But that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. We're discovering by scientists, independent scientists, using air filters in Japan, that the average person in Tokyo breathed in about 10 of these hot particles every day all the way through the month of April. Those same scientists using air filters are discovering that in Fukushima, people were probably breathing in 30 or 40 times more radiation than they were in Tokyo. <clears throat> Again, in the form of a hot particle. And what surprised me was that air filters in, um, in Seattle indicate that people there were absorbing five hot particles every day for the month of April. Now, you can't run a Geiger counter over someone's lung on the outside to determine if they have a hot particle because those particles, those rays, don't travel outside the body. They do their damage to the local tissue. But we know they're there because the air filter results indicate that they are. We'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia, I think two to five years from now. And then solid cancers will start appearing um, 15 to 60, 70 years later. So the ace up the sleeve is of the nuclear industry is the incubation time for cancer. It takes a long time for cancers to develop once you have inhaled or been exposed to these radioactive elements. And no cancer identifies its origin. And so there is already a level of cancer in society, but it's going to increase dramatically. <laughs>
The terrible child of the great Tohoku earthquake and tsunami is a gargantuan and relentless menace that has the potential to claim victims and casualties, not in the mere thousands as the tsunami did. This new menace could be spoken of in millions, if not tens of millions of deaths and casualties in this generation and generations to come. Remarkably, what is accompanying this disaster is an incredible lack of interest from heads of government, the media, and the United Nations. In swamping and overwhelming the defenses of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility owned by Tokyo Electric Power Company, the tsunami gave rise to the much greater and more permanent monstrous spectre of global nuclear contamination. Radiation from Fukushima is still spewing from its reactors, with some potentially even more horrifying twists in the plot to come. Radioactive contamination cannot be readily understood or dealt with in terms easily grasped by the man on the street. It does not alarm our primal survival instincts that normally alert us to danger. Radiation cannot be seen. Radiation cannot be felt or touched. It has no taste, no scent, and no odor. It does not announce itself like an earthquake or a marauding invader or an enraged supernatural monster. But once released, radiation can move seamlessly and soundlessly through walls, tarps, and defensive barriers. It seeps into soil and water tables. It is an eager traveler, contemptuous of sovereign boundaries, oceans, and continents. By taking to the wind, hitchhiking on far-flung pollen grains, or falling with precipitation. Rather than taking on a terrifying tsunami-like physical force, destroying all in its path until it is exhausted of energy, radiation is an indefatigable and deadly ghost, seemingly absent and invisible, yet omnipresent and irresistible. Once released, its lethality has, in human lifespan terms, a permanent quality, as plutonium has a half-life of 24,100 years. In high doses, radiation can kill and maim in hours. Dispersed, it can patiently lodge itself in a plant, animal or human host, giving rise to a whole range of death-dealing ailments. If it does not strike dead the original host, it can easily kill or maim the offspring. If, if, a, if a fetus, a normal, genetically chromosomally normal fetus, um, is exposed to a tiny bit of plutonium that lodges in its brain, developing brain. It can kill a cell that's going to form the right half of the brain or the left arm. That's called teratogenesis, damage of a normal fetus. It also, plutonium in particular, which is highly mutagenic, lodges in the testicles. It has a predilection for testicles and it lodges next to the spermatogonia, the cells that form the sperm, the precursors. And it's an alpha emitter, highly mutagenic, so it can mutate genes in the sperm to induce genetic mutations and genetic disease down the generations. And it takes up to 20 generations for recessive mutations to express themselves. So we're talking about eons of time for expression of genetic disease. That's the second thing. The third thing is if the man's got plutonium in his testicles and every male in the northern hemisphere has a tiny load in his gonads from weapons testing days and plutonium is still falling out. And the man's cremated. The smoke goes up the chimney with the plutonium so you can breathe it in. Another man can. And it's ad infinitum because plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years and lasts for a long time. But the other thing is that the body thinks plutonium is iron. It's an iron analogue. So it's stored in the liver where it causes liver cancer. It's stored in the bone marrow to pour, cause, um, to produce haemoglobin in the red blood cells, but it causes leukemia or, or bone cancer. It uh, crosses the placenta into the developing embryo, which lets nothing through it, incidentally, except plutonium and a few other nasties. It, it got, it's stored in the uh, testicle too. So. It's a ubiquitous, really dangerous isotope. And from the time they discovered it in the Manhattan Project, they knew its dangers. In 
In the immediate aftermath of the explosions at the Daiichi nuclear plant, the Japanese government declared its nation safe from nuclear contamination, bar a 30 km exclusion zone surrounding the nuclear plant. Similarly, the United States raised no alarm to its citizens downwind of the nuclear plant. Little or no consideration was given to the possibility of nuclear fallout reaching its shores. On the contrary, the World Health Organization issued a report describing how a number of people had comically poisoned themselves by taking the precaution of taking iodine tablets to protect their thyroid glands from the radioactive iodine they feared would arrive from Fukushima. Major news organizations like CNN, BBC and Reuters chimed in with a situation normal message, often citing reassurances that the radiation exposure would be no more than that received in a CAT scan. Japanese news platforms chose not to report on the radiation altogether. There were myriad commentaries on how the radiation would never see the shores of North America. As if to reinforce a mirage of safety and to quell any public concerns, there were radiation positive news items and commentaries. Protagonists on the left and the right sounded the non-alarm regarding the supposedly benign radiation. George Monbiot, writing in The Guardian, stated that his faith in nuclear energy was strengthened in light of Fukushima and that we needed more nuclear power plants. On the right, Ann Coulter, a conservative American political commentator, declared that radiation is actually beneficial to human health. In Japan itself, the appointed nuclear safety advisor to the Japanese government notably quipped to audiences that any ill effects of radiation could be countered by the mere act of smiling in its presence. There were innumerable reassurances that if there were Fukushima radiation present, it was in such low concentrations as to be unworthy of concern. Dr. Michio Kaku was one of the few voices allowed on mainstream media, calling the Fukushima disaster for what it truly was. That's right, this could be the granddaddy of all industrial accidents. In December 2011, the Japanese government and TEPCO announced that they had achieved cold shutdown of the three reactors. This proved to be an empty milestone as it was merely an announcement of what was on their timetable for shutdown, rather than a reflection of any physical achievement. However, a successful shutdown was in fact achieved, that is the shutdown of any negative news about the reactors and the Daiichi plant. The government invoked Article 15 of the Constitution, permitting them to negate and suppress any reporting of the disaster they saw fit. Indeed, the Japanese media and entertainment complex fell into line. In reality, what was occurring behind the scenes from March 11 onward at TEPCO and within the Japanese government was a sordid drama of sheer panic, cover-up and disinformation. Within hours of the accident, we now know it was like the Keystone Cops. People that are clueless, headless, just running around crazy, not knowing what to do. On March 11, 2011, the tsunami wipes out the Fukushima Daiichi plant's water cooling systems, causing the nuclear fuel rods in reactors 1, 2 and 3 to heat up and explode. At reactor 4, there is a large hydrogen explosion. These incidents release tremendous amounts of radiation and radioactive hot particles into the air. TEPCO raises no alarm to the public. Inside Fukushima Daiichi, plant manager Masao Yoshida refuses to abandon the stricken plant, as his superiors at TEPCO headquarters are urging him to do. Instead, he pleads on the phone with Prime Minister Naoto Kan's officials that Daiichi should not be abandoned. TEPCO's president, Masutaka Shimizu, makes competing calls to Khan's office, saying that the company should be permitted to evacuate all staff. Yoshida vehemently opposes this and further defies TEPCO by ignoring their order not to flood the reactors with seawater, thereby avoiding what would have been probably the meltdown of all six reactors and incineration of all the nuclear fuel assemblies in storage near the reactors. In Tokyo, government science advisors inform the Prime Minister of the situation with the sketchy information that TEPCO has provided them. Prime Minister Naoto Kan seriously contemplates the unthinkable, ordering the evacuation of Tokyo, a city of 30 million souls. 
Special Advisor Professor Kenichi Matsumoto, present at the emergency meeting, says, In the end, talk of tens of millions being evacuated was dismissed, with fears it would cause mass panic and chaos worse than the nuclear crisis itself. Khan confesses later that he doubted privately at the time whether Japan could continue to function as a state. What this directly implies is that the decision not to evacuate Tokyo was not based on public health considerations. Rather, it was based on the necessity to avoid panic and maintain the veneer of normalcy and calm. Despite the growing radiation danger, the integrity of the nation-state of Japan and its capital had to be held at all costs. Back at the Daiichi plant, reactors 1, 2 and 3 suffer complete meltdowns and the hydrogen explosion at reactor 4 severely damages the building housing the reactor and a vast nuclear fuel pool stacked above it. The pool is exposed to the open air, further imperiling the people of Japan and the Northern Hemisphere to this very day. While the decision not to evacuate Tokyo and North Japan made by the Prime Minister may have avoided panic and chaos, they have only resulted in a very calm and orderly irradiation of tens of millions of Japanese people. With time, even low doses of radiation kills, maims, reduces life expectancy, causes birth deformities, and manifests itself in lesser, seemingly unrelated maladies, ranging from heightened skin irritation to severe lethargy. No level of radiation exposure is safe, and the effects are cumulative. Also, hot particles released from Fukushima are not easily detected. Once breathed in, they become in internal emitters, irradiating the surrounding tissues and causing cancers. But after the Fukushima meltdown, the Japanese government inexplicably switched off all public radiation readers and meters. The government even raised the acceptable level of radiation for children from 1 millisievert to 20 millisieverts a year, the same as nuclear power plant workers. It was as if by the mere making of government decree, the biology of children had magically changed to that of an adult in terms of radiation tolerance. Radiation does the greatest damage to children and the unborn as they have the fastest growing cells. Radiation stunts their growth and greatly reduces their life expectancy. If we are to consider what could be the health legacy of Fukushima, perhaps we should consider the Chernobyl meltdown of 1986. To date, the Chernobyl accident has been estimated to have killed one million people worldwide. We must remember that the Chernobyl reactor had a partial meltdown while running at low capacity. At Fukushima, there were three complete reactor meltdowns in reactors that were running at full capacity. These fuel rods contained not only cesium, but MOX, plutonium-based fuel. Nuclear scientist Arne Gunnarsson opined that Fukushima is at least 10 times worse than Chernobyl. Chernobyl was in a sparsely populated area. Fukushima Daiichi is in a relatively densely populated area, with the huge metropolis of Tokyo only 250 kilometers away inhabited by 30 million people. In the year after Chernobyl, all European fresh produce and milk was banned and food was shipped in from outside areas. In contrast, in Japan, Fukushima and Tohoku food and produce has been pushed as safe and sent and sold all over the country. Members of the popular boy band Tokyo went on TV to express their support by eating Tohoku agricultural produce. While their relative youth may aid staving off radiation illness for a few years yet, a middle-aged TV presenter, Norikazu Otsuka, was not so lucky. He ate Fukushima produce on air regularly and in short time was diagnosed with acute leukemia and hospitalized. Some Japanese citizens have not waited on their government to be the final arbiter of what the actual radiation risk is in their country. 
individuals have been doing surveys with personal Geiger counters, finding and measuring time and time again areas with radiation well beyond what is deemed safe for children, not to mention adults. This is occurring not just within the 30 km exclusion zone from the nuclear plant, but in major population centers, two, three hundred, even five hundred kilometers from Fukushima. Nuclear scientist Ani Gundersen, on a fact-finding mission to Tokyo, took five random soil samples from around the city soon after the disaster. I just went around with five plastic bags, and when I found an area, I just scooped up some dirt and put it in the bag. One of those samples was from a crack in the sidewalk. Another one of those samples was from a children's playground that had been previously decontaminated. Another sample had come from some moss on the side of the road. Another sample came from a, um, um, the, the roof of an office building that I was at. And the last sample was right across the street from the main judicial center in downtown Tokyo. Well, I brought those samples back, declared them through customs, and sent them to the lab. And the lab determined that all of them would be qualified as radioactive waste here in the United States and would have to be shipped to Texas to be disposed of. Now think about the ramifications for the nation's capital, whether it's Tokyo or the United States. How would you like it if you went to pick your flowers and were kneeling in radioactive waste? That's what's happening in Tokyo now. Dr. Paolo Scampa an eminent chemical physicist recently announced his calculations of deadly radioactivity in Tokyo. He found that the radiation measured at Tokyo Station corresponds to 25 times the maximum permissible artificial hourly dose, that of 0.114 microsieverts per hour. His findings were reported in Veterans Today, which called for the evacuation of US military personnel from Tokyo declaring being stationed there akin to a death sentence. Naturally, for Japanese people living within 200 to 300 kilometers from Fukushima, the same must hold true. It has not taken long for the radiation to physically manifest its presence. What is more, there is a constant stream of classic radiation illnesses afflicting children, women and the elderly. Anything from severe lethargy, constant nosebleeds, hair falling out and discoloured fingernails to sudden heart attacks. In Fukushima itself, people who have come to local hospitals with what they thought were radiation related illnesses were told by hospital staff that they needed psychiatric help and were given drugs to alleviate their suffering. It is well known that many pregnant women in and around Fukushima are aborting their babies out of fear of birth defects. And mothers like Yayoi Inuma are just one of hundreds who believe their children are already suffering the effects. Ten-year-old Hannah has had severe joint pain in the arms and legs, deep rings under her eyes and extreme tiredness, to the point she sleeps for hours during the day. All symptoms of radiation sickness, say nuclear safety experts. If it was just one thing, that would mean it was something else. But all the symptoms came at once. When we left Tokyo for a bit this summer, she got better right away. 
The gradual sickening of the population is likely unless a major change is effected. Mass evacuation of North Japan and the Kanto Plain, including Tokyo itself, cannot be deemed unreasonable. As yet, no evacuation order has been given. This despite the fact that radiation has cut a huge swath through the small nation state of Japan. The contamination may very well render Japan mostly uninhabitable in the years to come. The irradiation of Japan and the evacuation of its eastern and northern regions that surely must take place has taken on the resemblance of some uniquely Japanese science fiction melodrama, just like an apocalyptic manga or anime plotline that has somehow metaphysically made the leap from the realm of the fantastical into a present day reality. Fiction has become everyday fact, yet tragically, this has not truly been grasped by a Japanese and wider world public suspended in disbelief that the radiation situation merits urgent evacuation and their gravest concern and vigilance. Not only is the radiation afflicting Japanese people daily, it has gleefully ridden the Pacific jet stream, taking flight to land in North America and breach into all parts of the Northern Hemisphere. One study that was allowed to make the light of day held that 14,000 Americans had died a year after the Fukushima plant meltdown as a result of the traveling radiation. Yet no initiative has been made by the government authorities to warn, prepare or inform Americans or Canadians for the radiation onslaught. In fact, virtually all government radiation devices were switched off in North America. Radiation, of course, carries on its deadly agenda, whether publicly acknowledged or not, in places near and very, very far from Fukushima, Japan. The map I'm going to show you tonight, if I'm not making this stuff up, this comes from the Norwegian Air Institute. The reason why the Norwegians are paying attention to this is because back when Chernobyl took place, they got a little bit of the radioactivity that came out of Chernobyl landed in under their country. Here's the west coast. I'm on that little island. I've been saying for a long time, we need to get the heck off. These levels, the yellow levels, is the same thing that's coming out of Japan. So don't think that it's different, it's, it's diluted. Here we go. There's the 9th of May. That's, here's the 5th. The 6th. The 7th. Sphere. You can see the yellow over in Japan, right? That's the same yellow that's going to be coming our way. See that yellow right out of Japan? That's what I showed you on the other map. So those of you that, are, that there's people out there saying, no, 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 that it's diffused and it's not the same. No, it's the same intensity. And I'm showing Xenon Gas 133 because it's one of the ones that's the easiest detectable gases, radioactive gases. Our media keeps stressing the less dangerous ones, there's hundreds of radioactive particles that are in this gas, and, and sorry, that are coming out of these reactors. Um, it's just rained, so... Point zero four. <laughs> right, right, well that's what the, um, that's the worst part about it, is it's small little particles, it's not... Anyway, much, let's go to the green. Feel like, you know, it's gonna be... Let's see what happens to Number 34, 37 is about my average. And it's going way high. Oh, it's it ten times. Bearing in mind, 370, 340 is, is ten is times my background. And this is jet stream. So this is like gone past 20 times. Okay. Here we go. And again. This is my water spoke. Our measurement is done. Thus we have a worldwide public health time bomb that is primed to explode. The lag from when the radiation poisoning and ingestion occurs to when cancer and leukemia appear 
could be as early as two to six years. Given the exposure to which millions of Japanese and residents of the Northern Hemisphere have already been subjected, it is for many of them only a matter of time before the cancers manifest themselves. Yet what could explain the inaction and willful ignorance of our entrusted authorities, the United Nations, the IAEA, the World Health Organization, the US government, NATO, and on and on. It is well known that the nuclear industry has long and very powerful tentacles that penetrate into and crisscross through governments, multinationals, and the defense industries. At Chernobyl, the Soviet regime wanted to hush the severity of the accident as it would call into question the legitimacy and prestige of Soviet nuclear power. At Fukushima, we find that the Mark I nuclear reactors were designed by General Electric, who have 23 Mark I reactor plants operating across the United States, and in total has designed 91 nuclear power plants in 11 countries. Despite several engineers resigning decades ago over the design flaws of the Mark I reactor, its design was nevertheless approved for use. A Japanese media official, a week after the earthquake speaking anonymously, stated, The United States is trying hard to prevent Japan from exposing the role of General Electric Company by exerting too much pressure on Japan. The United States' effort is aimed at preventing further pessimism on behalf of the Japanese people towards the US. General Electric has very strong ties to the military industrial complex and the US government and incredibly does not pay taxes in the United States despite multi-billion dollar annual profits. The IAEA itself admits that it exists in order to promote nuclear power no less. Notably, the Queen of England has 30% of her investments in nuclear energy and uranium mining. A report from Al Jazeera shed light on the money trail that funds the cover-ups of any negative news on the nuclear industry. In the report, David Biello the energy and climate editor at Scientific American Online said that obtaining clear information on incidents such as the Fukushima Daiichi disaster is very difficult. Biello states that there is a lot of secrecy that can surround nuclear power because some of the same processes that can be involved in generating electricity can also be involved in developing a weapon. So there's a kind of veil of secrecy that gets dropped over this stuff that can also obscure the truth. The Nuclear Energy Institute, a policy organization for the nuclear industry with 350 companies, which of course includes TEPCO, has not responded to journalists' requests for information on funding research and chairs at universities. M.V. Ramana, a researcher at Princeton University specializing in the nuclear industry, reveals that most of the funding for nuclear research does not come directly from the nuclear lobby, but from governments who receive donations from the lobby. Ramana continues this by saying, the Department of Energy has a very close relationship with the nuclear industry, and they sort of try to advance the industry's interest. So those people who get funding from that, it's not like they, the researchers, want to lie but there's a certain amount of, shall we say, ideological commitment to nuclear power, as well as a certain amount of self-censorship. It comes down to wondering how their next application for funding might be viewed, he said. A Department of Energy program called Major Areas of Research concerns not only engineering, but also nuclear weapons. As a case in point, the genesis of plutonium and depleted uranium from power plant nuclear fission finds its way into weapon systems of the US military. The utilities make money by selling electricity, that's all. They don't have to build the reactors, it's all subsidised and paid for. I mean, no other industry has that sort of subsidisation. And do you know why? Because it's the 
prodigal son of the weapons industry. And when nuclear power was begun by Eisenhower in the 50s, atoms for peace, the weapons industry said we require nuclear power as a sort of Trojan horse, camouflage to hide behind. And then and then everyone said it was safe. The Japanese didn't want nuclear power after Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but they were talked into it. Uh, so it's a really wicked, wicked industry. The use of depleted uranium munitions in Fallujah, Iraq, has resulted in contamination and poisoning of civilians and US soldiers. Horrifying birth defects among the offspring of Iraqis and returning US soldiers and the lack of acknowledgement of this disaster merely hint of a wider and sinister agenda by the US government and the nuclear industry. In Japan itself, an independent report revealed that the Fukushima meltdowns were preventable had the government and TEPCO followed basic safety recommendations. Instead of shoring up emergency power systems, TEPCO successfully fought off any regulations that would cost them money or expose the lack of safety controls at their plants to the public. The report also placed blame on the government for colluding with TEPCO by permitting internal complacency in lieu of official regulations stipulated on the books. Moreover, nuclear plants have been restarted despite hundreds of thousands of Japanese citizens protesting against them. It seems that the government is the nuclear industry, and the nuclear industry is the government. Certainly, this very, very cosy relationship between TEPCO, GE, the United States and Japanese governments, the military-industrial complex, and even international nuclear research academia, plus the intertwining of nuclear engineering and nuclear weapons interests, goes a long way to explaining why any negative news about the reactors and their radiation is strongly suppressed and ridiculed. If we are to confront this crisis, we will have to deal not only with the ongoing radiation release, but three major shadow points that threaten to escalate the crisis to a possible extinction level event. Firstly, the three reactor cores from Fukushima Daiichi reactor buildings 1, 2 and 3. After much denial and distortion, it has emerged that all three have been melting through the soil and ground beneath the building since March 12, 2011. This is what is dubbed China Syndrome, where a super hot melted down reactor core penetrates the floor of its building and bores and burns its way into the ground below, all the way to China metaphorically, contaminating the soil and water table. If a reactor core finds water beneath, it can easily react with it and cause a steam-powered hydrovolcanic explosion. Digging and catching up to these three very hot runaway reactor cores in order to encase them in concrete to prevent this would be a monumental task for TEPCO. Each reactor core already has a 500-day lead on any search and entombment party. TEPCO have cried poor already on issues of the Daiichi nuclear plant cleanup and have so far based their responses on cost and shareholder considerations. Next, there is the matter of the plutonium-laden seawater that has been repatriated back into the Pacific Ocean. It has been projected that it will take five years for the radioactive plutonium seawater to encompass the whole of the Pacific Ocean. There is little indication that the plutonium release into the ocean has been halted to this day. Bluefin tuna have already shown up on the California coast 
with radioactive cesium in their bodies. The seafood basket of the world, the Pacific Ocean, along with its ecosystems and biodiversity, is imperiled beyond all measure. The consumption of any Pacific seafood must be vigorously discouraged, yet little has been done to prohibit it. Even green groups have been relatively silent on this issue for reasons unknown. The, the New York Times is reporting that uh, 200 tons of radioactive liquid are being poured into the nuclear reactors and the fuel pool at Fukushima every day. Well, where's it going? If it's going in, it's coming out. And it's coming out two ways. It's coming out as radioactive steam and it's coming out as radioactive water. Uh, offshore radioactive readings in the ocean have gone up and are now over three times, 3,000 times higher than the standards that are uh, routinely expected. That's not coming from the air. The ocean's too big to be, um, to be polluted by, by what's coming out of the airborne releases. It's clearly leaking from the trenches into the ocean. They haven't found the leak, but um, it, the only source of, of quantities of radioactive material uh, large enough to pollute the ocean has got to be leakage from these trenches. Finally, the last escalator is reactor number four at the very heart of the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Reactor four itself was empty, but it housed a very large and uncontained spent nuclear fuel pool on its roof. Due to the explosion, the reactor 4 building is severely damaged and has 1,535 fuel rod assemblies that are immersed in water but exposed to the air and the elements. They are also stacked high in the air on elevated racks like mere warehouse inventory. Moving these rods must be done while immersed in water and in heavily protected structures in an environment that is now highly radioactive. The crane equipment designated to perform this task was destroyed in the tsunami. Work has only just started now, in late 2012, on reinforcing Reactor Building 4 with a view to removing the 1535 fuel assemblies. The projected time that it will take to secure and remove the fuel assemblies is two and a half to three years, so sometime in 2015 or 2016. Another seven or eight magnitude earthquake is all that it would take to collapse the building and allow the fuel rods to crash to the ground, exposing them to the air and sparking the burning of all that cesium into the atmosphere. Such a fire cannot be put out with water once it is ignited. Contact with water creates a pyrophoric reaction in which oxygen from the water itself is extracted by the super hot rods to continue and enhance the burning and thus affect the release of radiation and cesium. Even a rocket propelled grenade attack by North Korean frogmen would do in reactor 4. The collapse of this single building would be so catastrophic since the subsequent release of the 1535 fuel assemblies would easily trigger a huge radiological fire that would quickly spread to a nearby common spent fuel pool a mere 50 meters away with a further 6,375 fuel assemblies. This represents about 50 times the amount of radioactive cesium released from Chernobyl. There are a further 3,511 spent fuel assemblies in the Daiichi plant, and if they were absorbed into the fire also, it would be a cesium release 85 times that of Chernobyl. Mitsuhei Murata, a respected diplomat and former Japanese ambassador to Sweden, declared that if Reactor 4 collapses, the whole of the Earth's northern hemisphere would have to be evacuated and does not rule out a global human extinction event. Nuclear scientist Arne Gundersen and physician Helen Caldicott have both stated that they would leave the Northern Hemisphere if Reactor 4 collapsed.
However, if there's another earthquake and building four collapses which contains the cooling pool with fresh fuel, I'm going to evacuate my family from Boston. If the spent fuel pool at Reactor 4 hits the ground, that is literally the end of Tokyo, Yokohama, and most of Honshu. There's no question about it. It has visually been observed to be leaning in the past month. That the rest of the world is doing nothing to help the Japanese because it's going to poison us in North America, Europe, all the way around the Every world. Every damn scientist, the best of the best from Europe, Russia, China, America, should be in Japan or studying this around the clock and making recommendations. They've got to get not only outside the box, they've got to get outside the planet to start thinking about this, or there isn't going to be any planet left. It's that bad. Right. The tonnage just in spent fuel pool number four is over 260 tons of rods, fuel rods. And remember, they were new ones. Most of them were used. This is what we're told anyway. There were MOX fuel rods in there. And when a fuel rod has lived its useful life boiling water, it's far more dangerous than it was as a brand new fuel rod that first gets inserted into the reactor vessel. It's exactly. all nuts. It would almost certainly spark mass evacuations to the southern hemisphere. It is indeed very possible that the radioactive scourge could engulf the entire planet and spark a major die-off of the human species and the animal and plant life we live alongside and depend upon. The characters in On the Beach knew they were doomed from the outset. Yet more than a gloomy surrender film, On the Beach was ironically a plea to its audience. The banner declaring there is still time was perhaps a desperate cry from the year 1959 to the future to highlight the potential dangers and horrors of nuclear power and radiation in order to galvanize its audiences to make better choices, take action and demand answers to bring about happier tomorrows. The inexplicable absence of any credible government or mutilateral response or even reasonable coverage from mass media outlets suggests that these institutions are captured by the international nuclear industry. It seems we the people are alone on this one. There is still time not to savour before we die, but to speak out and act in order that we and our brethren do not die out. If we act, we may be able to salvage something of our environment and protect our children. If inaction and indifference is to be our response, then we are, for all intents and purposes, no matter where we live across the globe, all standing on Fukushima Beach together, waiting for the lethal radiation to take us en masse. We will be judged by our children one way or another.